Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing in our study in the book of First Enoch, and today we are going to begin chapter 91, which is known as the beginning of the epistle of Enoch, and will carry us through to the end. But in my particular version, it says the concluding section of the book. So according to the version that I'm reading in, chapter 92 will begin the book of Enoch. But most Bible scholars tell us that we are beginning the book of Enoch in chapter 91. But as we read, especially in the beginning verses here, you'll see that Enoch is concluding what he has told us up until this point. Now, I have placed the link in the description box below if you'd like to follow along with us. So if you have that open and your Bibles, let's begin chapter 91, verse 1. It says, And now, my son Methuselah, call to me all thy brothers, and gather together to me all the sons of thy mother. For the word calls me, and the Spirit is poured out upon me. It's interesting that it says, the word calls me. Because we know that Jesus is identified throughout the second covenant, the New Testament, as the living word. He says, do these things that I may show you everything that shall befall you forever. And thereupon Methuselah went and summoned to him all his brothers and assembled his relatives. And he spake unto all the children of righteousness and said, hear ye sons of Enoch, all the words of your father. And hearken aright to the voice of my mouth. For I exhort you and to say unto you, Beloved, love uprightness and walk therein. And draw not nigh to uprightness with a double heart. In other words, do not be tossed to and fro, as James tells us, in what you believe. Read the word of God, study the word of God, believe the word of God, and let that direct your lives. He continues, and associate not with those of a double heart. So be not double hearted and don't even associate with those that are double hearted. Why? Because they will corrupt you. There is something about human nature that if we spend time with a certain kind of people, we become like them. I mean, you've probably noticed that in your own lives. You have a friend who uses a certain phrase or certain terminology and before long you're using it. And so he's saying, be very careful who you spend your time with. Do not associate with those of a double heart. You need to guard yourselves in this area. Or as the old saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. If you're a man or woman of uprightness, of holiness and godliness, then that's who you should be spending your time with. And not only who you should be spending your time with, but who you would want to spend your time with. If you find yourself desiring to spend time with people who are ungodly in their character, you should look very closely at your own heart because that should be a telltale sign to you that something is wrong within you. Enoch continues, But walk in righteousness, my sons, and it shall guide you on good paths, and righteousness shall be your companion. For I know that violence must increase on the earth. And we who read the Bible know the very same thing because we've already been told. Violence will increase upon the earth. That's why it's vain for us to pray prayers that righteousness would be restored upon the earth. And yet at the other side of our mouth, we say, come Lord Jesus. Well, if we want Jesus to come, things have got to get really, really bad, friends. And so what our prayer needs to be is God give us the strength, the stamina, the fortitude to be able to withstand these evil days that are coming and to stand faithful and true to your word during these troubled times. So he says, I know that violence must increase on the earth and a great chastisement be executed on the earth and all unrighteousness will come to an end. Yea, it shall be cut off from its roots and its whole structure will be destroyed. And unrighteousness shall again be consummated on the earth. And all the deeds of unrighteousness and of violence and transgression shall prevail in a twofold degree. And when sin and unrighteousness and blasphemy and violence and all kinds of deeds increase, 
and apostasy, which is desertion of godly living, and transgression and uncleanness increase, a great chastisement shall come from heaven upon all these. And the Holy Lord will come forth with wrath and chastisement to execute judgment on earth. In those days, violence shall be cut off from its roots, and the roots of unrighteousness together with deceit. Now, it's interesting that it uses that word deceit there, because what I think of are all the hidden secrets that have been kept from us common people. Those who are in leadership and authoritative positions, i.e. government positions, have kept so many things from us. And that's why conspiracy theories exist and live because if all was done in the light that has been done, there would be no room for speculation. But the reason that speculation exists from those who are below these levels of authority is because of deceit. And yet it tells us here that deceit shall be destroyed from under heaven, along with unrighteousness and violence. In verse 9, And all the idols of the heathen shall be abandoned, and the temples burned with fire, and they shall remove them from the whole earth. So all these pagan temples that have been built to these false gods over in the eastern areas of the world, you got the Hindu temples, you've got the Buddhist temples, you've got the Krishna temples, and those are just some of the major religions. How many other temples, even here in America, the Satanic temples, the Mormon temples, the Mason temples, all of these temples shall be removed from the whole earth, and they, the heathen, shall be cast into the judgment of fire, and they shall perish in wrath and in grievous judgment forever. And the righteous shall arise from their sleep. Notice it does not say from the dead. It does not say coming back from paradise. It says the righteous shall arise from their sleep. Why? Because when we die, we sleep. Let me give you some examples. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now let me give you some other text so you may look into this a little bit closer. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6 and verse 51. John chapter 14, verse 3. Job chapter 3, verses 4 through 19. John chapter 11, verse 11. John chapter 5, verse 28. And Job chapter 14, verse 12 are just a few verses that reiterate the fact that we as God's people, when we pass on from this life, we go into a state of sleep awaiting that great trumpet sound that will bring us back to be with the Lord forever. So he says, The righteous shall arise from their sleep, and wisdom shall arise and be given unto them. And after that, the roots of unrighteousness shall be cut off, and the sinners shall be destroyed by the sword, shall be cut off from the blasphemers in every place, and those who plan violence and those who commit blasphemy shall perish by the sword. Now in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 we're told, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15 we are told, out of his mouth, the Lord Jesus' mouth, goeth a sharp sword. Well it's not a physical sword, it's the word of God. And so if we reread verse 11 and replace sword with the word of God, it says, After that the roots of uprighteousness shall be cut off, and the sinners shall be destroyed by the word of God, shall be cut off from the blasphemers in every place, and those who plan violence and those who commit blasphemy shall perish by the word of God. Verse 12, And after that there shall be another, the eighth week, that of righteousness, and a sword, or the word of God, shall be given to it, 
and that a righteous judgment may be executed on the oppressors. And sinners shall be delivered into the hands of the righteous. And at its close, they shall acquire houses through their righteousness. And a house shall be built for the great king in glory forevermore. And all mankind shall look to the path of uprightness. And after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world. And all the works of the godless shall vanish from all the earth, and the world shall be written down for destruction. And after this, in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there shall be the great eternal judgment, in which he will execute vengeance amongst the angels. These are those who led mankind astray to begin with. And the first heaven shall depart and pass away, and a new heaven shall appear, and all the powers of the heavens shall give sevenfold light. This should remind you of Second Peter. And after that, there will be many weeks without number forever, and all shall be in goodness and righteousness, and sin shall no more be mentioned forever. And now I tell you, my sons, and show you the paths of righteousness and the paths of violence. Yea, I will show them to you again, that you may know what will come to pass. And now hearken unto me, my sons, and walk in the paths of righteousness. Walk not in the paths of violence, for all who walk in the paths of unrighteousness shall perish forever. And that brings us to the close of chapter 91 and what appears to be the sections that we have been studying over the last many weeks. And so next time we'll pick up in chapter 92. But again, let's look at verse 3 and 4 and let us take this from this chapter today. Hear ye, sons of Enoch, all the words of your father, and hearken aright to the voice of my mouth. For I exhort you, and I say unto you, beloved, love uprightness and walk therein. Let me read that again. Love uprightness, passionately desire uprightness, and walk therein, and draw not nigh, don't even get close to uprightness with a double heart, be focused in your journey, be single-minded, like a laser, focus in on your target, and don't let your sights sway to the left or the right, associate not with those of a double heart, should we share the love of Jesus with them? Absolutely. Should we spend the majority of our time with them? Absolutely not. Walk in righteousness, my sons, and it will guide you on good paths. It will never lead you astray. And righteousness shall be your companion. So if you have found that you have been led astray, that you have veered off the path, it's because you have not walked in righteousness. It is, it's because you have not been careful and cautious in your journey. You have been tantalized and teased and tempted by things that are off the path. And to get to them, you must leave the path. But if you stay upon the path of righteousness, it will guide you and righteousness shall be your companion. And who is righteousness? The Lord Jesus himself. He will be your companion every step along the way of your journey. As long as you and I keep what Enoch has told us here and other great men of God have told us in our Bibles. Well, on that note, friends, we'll end. I pray that your journey today will be blessed in Jesus. I pray that your heart will be full of praise and adoration. And I pray that all that you do will bring him honor, praise, and glory as you seek to serve him faithfully each moment of this day. Now, I love you, friends. As Yahweh wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.